Um, totally regret the name. Picked it while I was, you know, putting together the uh, abstract, and I just kind of have to run with it. So bear with me. Um, so let's get started. So my name is Devin. Um, I'm a principal engineer at Odin. I've been at Odin for about four years now. Um, and I'm actually responsible for our commitment to Beam. Um, I had done some stream processing in the past without you know, a framework and learned the hard way that that's actually really hard and ended up using, um, you know, when I joined Odin, one of my coworkers told me to take a look at Beam and it looked like the right thing to use. And we've actually really doubled down on it. So we're running Beam on top of Dataflow. Um, I recognize I don't actually look like this anymore. Um, this is, you know, my standard uh, profile picture I use for everything. Um, but, you know, this pandemic happened and my barber shut down and my hair grew out. So luckily through the transfer of uh, the magic of transfer learning, I was able to update this photo. And now it looks more appropriately like me. Um, if this was an in-person talk, I would expect everyone to have this like dry chuckle right now, but it's not. So I'm just going to, we're all going to use our imagination and believe that that was funny. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to Jay, uh, our senior data engineer, who's kind of helped make this into reality. Uh, he's currently spending some time with his family and he's on a very all consuming on call rotation. Um, but he really helped see a lot of this to, you know, fruition. In this talk, we're going to talk about why does Odin need batch recoveries for our streaming jobs? What does that mean? Um, and how we make our streaming jobs also run in batch mode. Um, so I actually think this is the coolest feature of Beam, the fact that you can run a job that's streaming or batch in the same framework. Uh, everyone else is really into this idea of like, oh, I can write things in Go, or I can use data frames, or write SQL for some reason. This is, or make something scalable. This is the coolest feature of Beam, hands down. Um, and we're going to talk about how we orchestrate our streaming pipelines to run in batch mode daily, uh, and what that means. So let's start by talking a little bit about Odin. Um, we actually did a couple earlier talks in this uh this conference you might want to go back and watch some of those um but to give you a high overview uh our customers are medium to large manufacturers in plastic extrusion injection molding uh pipes chemical paper pulp anything that's kind of like a continuous process data um these are all like component manufacturers so they're not like the people who build the ford f-150 but they're building you know the wires that go behind the dashboard their injection molding the plastic that goes in the dashboard stuff like that if you work for a company like this for a few years you start to realize that everything around you is manufactured and how you know real it is in everyday life, um, and our you know our users tend to be people who are like process or quality engineers who are trying to centralize or act on their data, or like plant managers who are worried about optimizing day to day operations stuff like that. Um, our product is kind of reminiscent of like New Relic or Datadog or Stackdriver. It does you know time series reporting stuff. Um, manufacturing data is pretty cool, um, so that's what we deal with all day. It's not boring like the regular metrics. Uh, that we deal with um, as engineers. Um, and yeah, it's the kind of stuff that process engineers really love. Um, we also do some real-time stuff. We do real-time time series views. We do stuff that's integrated on the factory floor, the stuff that our floor supervisors care a lot about. And we do like, you know, reporting and alerting. And um, we send emails when something goes wrong, or we send an email report when you're starting your day at 11 a.m. or at 10 a.m. between March and November because time zones are hard. Uh, but let's get into the good stuff. So how we use and you know sometimes misuse Apache Beam. Um, it is a heavily invested piece of our infrastructure. Um, to start, you can kind of look at, look at our data as all coming from a factory. So generally, data coming from factory is coming from a PLC. PLC stands for Programmable Logic Controller. It was invented by Dick Morley, January 1st, 1968, uh, during a New Year's Day hangover. Um, in the past, we've had to sit between the PLC, we've had hardware that sits between the PLC and the cloud. Um, and uh, since then, we've started to work with, you know, systems integrators who, you know, modernize the PLCs to push directly to the cloud. Uh, and if you're more interested in this, I recommend you go back and look at Dan's talk. He kind of talks about this a bit more. Um, and we ultimately use Cloud IoT, which we have a lot of opinions about, if you want to ask us about. But ultimately, we get our data into a pub subtopic. And that's where we start processing it with Apache Beam. Um, events that are pushed up represent metrics or changes to process metadata. Uh, so maybe someone started working on a line or started some sort of batch manufacturing process, or just, you know, it's a sampled metric saying that the current temperature of this, you know, you, this melting vat of plastic is whatever it is. Um, continuing on, once we get that into that pub subtopic, we have this code go right into this job called acquisition, 
It was a surprisingly easy job to write and a surprisingly hard name to spell every time I've had to write it ever since. Uh, this job kind of does this octopus or there's like a word for this, like a centipod, many armed thing um, where it kind of takes the data and separates it out into a bunch of separate pub subtopics. Um, and each one of these topics, you know, does different things. But the only one we really care about right now is this one tentacle, which is the uh, metrics topic. That's the bulk of our data. Um, it's this raw sampled data and it's kind of metrics that you're used to. Um, it comes in about once a second. Um, it's melt temperatures, line speeds, screw RPMs. It's very similar to the metrics that you're used to as like an engineer when you look at like New Relic or Stackdriver or something. The difference is that when you know someone looks at a graph and says something's on fire, uh, it carries a much heavier weight in manufacturing data. Um, so let's talk about what we do with those metrics. So uh, a common problem that you see with these metrics is like you know you've got two sensors that are measuring the same thing but differently, and a user needs to combine them to make sense of them. Uh, in this case, they're making cable. Uh, so you've got like an X and a Y laser pointed at the cable and measuring, you know, two different dimensions of it. And they don't really care about the two di different dimensions. They want one version of it. Uh, so they want to take an average. Um, the way that we do this is kind of insane. We actually have a beam job that embeds a JavaScript interpreter uh, that, you know, can load in functions that are defined by the user as JavaScript. And we apply them in real time as a mapping function. We do a streaming join. It's kind of wild. It doesn't really matter what we're doing here. If you're more interested, you go back and watch just Juan's talk, but this is ultimately um, just a stage of the pipeline that we are doing, and that's kind of what matters here. Um, so that is done in two ways. Uh, it's done both this kind of like stateful metrics way and this kind of stateless metrics way. So we're doing both, um, you know, just second by second joins, and we also do these like window joins when you care about something over a period of time. Uh, it's similar stuff, but you know, two different ways of approaching the problem. Another thing that we do is we track state changes between in the behavior of the line. So this is a great use case for Beam because uh, you know you're trying to determine when a line has gone from being down due to some sort of maintenance issue to being running. Um, and the way you detect that is you're looking at the line speed of the line, which is a metric. And you don't want to do it. You don't want to like capture during this like flapping behavior. You can see there's this little spike just before we actually see the change event. You want to see it consistently above a threshold for a certain period of time. And this is a great use case for Beam because you can imagine how we use Windows and then trigger them and then you know set the timestamp back in the past. And you're like, wow, that must be so elegant. And it's not as beautiful as you think it is, but it does work pretty well. Um, and then we ultimately write these changes into Postgres. And so something that's interesting about this is it's downstream of our calculated metrics. So you know you might your line speed metric might be the function of other metrics. So we want to do that computation first. We write it to another pub subtopic along with all the raw metrics, and then ultimately the state change events are processed there. Um, we also do this thing that's like rollups. So this is common in a lot of kind of time series processing when you have like a lot of time series data and you want to do big aggregates of it. So what we do is instead of, you know, if you want to know what the mean of some big range of data is, instead of pulling out all the raw metrics, we do continuous rollups of those metrics in different size windows. And then we kind of combine those windows when you issue a query. And it's kind of cool here. You can kind of do um, anything that's like, there's actually a cool math property here. Anything that's um, like an associative aggregate or that you can express in a function of associative aggregates, you can compute here. So you can do like, counts, sums, means, you can actually do standard deviation too, uh, if you do a, the not standard standard deviation function. Um, so this is a common thing that we're doing. And we also do it specifically downstream of this metrics topic. So you're seeing that there's these stages of processing that we're doing and we're you know blocking them off by pub subtopics in between. And ultimately these get written along with the raw metrics to the time series database. And also in this case, these are item potent writes. So we can just continuously write them, dual writes are fine. And so you might look at this, you might be like, Devin, wow, what a beautiful streaming pipeline. I want to work for Odin because this looks so nice and you must have a great time. And I totally agree that if this was our pipeline, you'd have a great time. In reality, it looks a little bit more like this. Um, there are loops, there are things that are doing seemingly nothing. There are things that should be doing seemingly nothing, but somehow spew errors all day. Uh, but the simple model for this talk is fine. So we could just assume that our platform looks like the previous slide and go on from there. So let's talk about some common trends that we've just seen. So downstream writes are idempotent. Um, and what I mean by that is that double writing is OK, and the order doesn't really matter here. Uh, lots of windowing uh, keyed by the metric ID. So we have lots of windows, but we only care about that window within the, the space of a particular metric. So I care about this window for just you know the line speed metric or just this melt temperature metric. And then there's a lot of real-time processing that's needed for our users to make real-time decisions. 
Uh, so to try and clarify what I mean there, I'm going to, you know, quote Ricky Bobby here. If you ain't first, you're last. A lot of our real-time products need data in real time. We can't really be waiting here. So let's talk about why that's even something worth discussing. You might just be saying like Beam is a, you know, streaming is pretty real time already. Why, why is this a problem at all to worry about? So this is a map of the United States. Um, it's a map of the number of ISP options you have throughout the United States. Pink is one or less ISPs. I'm gonna tell you something that you might not know, but factories are not built in New York City, which is one of the few green zones on this map. Factories tend to be built in pink zones. Uh, areas that have very limited ISP coverage. So connectivity from that factory is sometimes, you know, throttled by a single source. And that can be difficult. And there's not a lot of competition in that space. Also, within the factory floor, connectivity is hard. So this is a map of Wi-Fi and one of our customers. And, you know, to give you a brief context here, negative 55 to negative 70, the green areas is considered good Wi-Fi. You can see there's a lot of green on this map. And there's a lot of metal, there's a lot of stuff going on. And sometimes this is constantly changing. You know, there might be a machine that turns on and that knocks out Wi-Fi for an area of the factory. So we have to accept the fact that there's gonna be a lot of partitions between the devices which are pushing our data and where we're getting that data. That looks something like this, you know, the data gets back to, so there's some sort of disconnect that happens either within the factory or outside of the factory. And that PLC or, you know, the hardware around that PLC starts to collect data, but back it up um, and wait for a connection to come back to push that data back out. And when it does push that data back out, uh, you know, it pushes it all into these, there's some jobs which are stateless like acquisition, which really don't care about the timestamp of the data, but other jobs which care a lot about the event time suddenly feel this late data coming in. So in these cases, if you have a bunch of late data coming in, the watermark, as you might know, goes, you know, gets stuck or maybe it shoots back, gets reassigned backwards. Um, and these jobs that are doing Windows start to struggle if you haven't defined those windows or the triggering strategy really well. It's not real time anymore. And you might be saying, Devin, Beam is great at late data. So why is this a problem? And you would be right, but Beam assumes the cause of lateness is homogenous. So all of the, you know, when it sees something that's late, it assumes it's all late for the same reason or all the data is late. Uh, and it assumes this by saying that the watermark is global. So when a subset of keys are lagging behind, the watermark for all keys is stuck behind and everyone is feeling that pain. So just by having a single factory, which is having a connectivity issue, all other factories are going to have less real-time triggering windows. And we have tried to solve this in a few kind of crazy ways. So the first thing we tried, um, you can tell that this is quite the try because there's a five to one ratio of code to comments or comments to code. Um, this is a kind of shared windowing logic that we use across a bunch of our jobs that do windowing. Um, and it it does all these crazy things with triggering um, to try and balance this on time versus lagging data. Uh, so like when we use an early fire plus process time delay for when what the watermark gets stuck due to a bunch of late data, we use late firing plus, plus process time delay to control the firing for late data from before the watermark. Um, and this all creates this kind of like deprecated behavior that happens when late data floods in. And it's real time-ish, but the deprecated behavior is not perfect for our customers. And the other thing is that, you know, data flow jobs can still get stuck when you have, when you're allowing for a high allowed lateness, um, at least in data flow. So data flow auto scaling will do things like, you know, it will see a big backlog and it will, because there's some secret, you know, max number of windows or something about our code. You know, we can handle this many windows that are not triggered at a certain time and those will build up and then it won't process any more data coming in. And then it will increase the number of workers because auto scaling will see that the backlog is filled. And those that backlog will then go into all of the other workers that have been auto scaled up. And then they'll sit there and then CPU will be really low and auto scaling will say, well, you're not doing anything. So let's scale back down. And you'll just see this vicious cycle of going up and down and up and down. Um, this is also just kind of crazy. Um, so I've tried to show this to multiple people. You can imagine there's an instant and I'm like, and they say, well, Devin, why is this happening? And I say, well, you could just go read this code, just read all the comments. And then they don't understand a single lick of it because they don't get what a trigger is or what a window is. And I say, well, actually what you should do is first go read the Beam programming guide from start to end. And that even seems like a lot. And I'm like, well, actually you should just go read streaming systems and then read the programming guide and then go read, you know, this comment. And the reality of it is that almost no one can ever do this. Uh, it's really complicated and it's tough. So I think that we're just in this realm of like something that's not really, you can't define a good runbook for this and you can't really fit this problem into someone's head really easily. 
We've also tried something like this. So, you know, I talked about how the global watermark is global and that's an issue. Uh, it's shared amongst all the keys. So we've tried to hand roll window, you know, per key window or watermark behavior ish. Uh, we do this with beam state. Um, it's a beam state using a concurrent skip list map of lists, uh, which is a really great data structure. Uh, you should all use it. It's really great if you want to like build an LRU cache or something. But in this case, we're using it to kind of simulate, you know, a window like behavior where we're actually like putting data into these different lists and then, you know, manually garbage collecting them. And this works decently, um, but we have to do things like completely disable auto scaling and data flow in order to deploy this job or else we get really weird auto scaling behaviors. And, you know, it still has issues. It's really hard to track. It's not ideal. Um, and yeah, it's to be honest, this is even more crazy. So I'm going to talk about a day that will ever forever live in infamy at Odin. So this is October 18th, 2019. So a customer's was factory was based in one of those pink zones. So their primary internet connections was actually via satellite dish. And this weekend storm comes through on, you know, comes through and knocks over the satellite dish. And for six days, they can't get someone out to their factory to repair the satellite dish that connects them to the internet. So during that time, six days of data for this entire factory gets backed up. And then on that woeful Friday, you know, the satellite dish is fixed and all the data gets flooded back into Odin. And this causes the auto scaling for both of our strategies totally scale fails. Um, a bunch of our jobs get stuck, pub sub topics back up, and all of our users subsequently experience this major outage. And it took over two weeks of engineering hours to do the recovery just for this job. And it was tough. I mean, it was a hard time, a lot of sleepless nights. And I sat, we we kind of sat and asked ourselves, there must be a better way to fix this problem. So we took a step back and we said, what is it that our users actually need? And we looked at the data. So if we look at the data, this is a graph of the access frequency of the data versus the age of the data. So if we look at that, uh, this is very common for a lot of you know analytics products. Recent data is accessed very frequently versus old data is accessed very infrequently. This is a classic power law distribution. And if you think about what are the use cases for accessing this data, it becomes obvious because you know that stuff that's over to the left the new data that's used predominantly for real-time decision making. It's used for you know monitoring lines that are happening right now. It's used for alerting. It's used for you know that supervisor who's trying to make you know production happen well this day. And the old data, the historical data, it's being accessed less frequently because it's being used for like you know big aggregate reports or when a process engineer wants to go through and say, well, what's the fastest I actually could make this product? Or how are we doing versus last year? Or are we improving over time? Or if I, have a, if I had an incident yesterday, can I find a similar pattern in the past? And so it's not that just because we're accessing it less frequently doesn't mean it's less useful. They're both very useful products, but the, the requirements of these two patterns are different or the requirements of these two ages of data are different. And when we look at this, we realize that our very late data is actually falling definitively in the historical analysis category. Um, it's not really useful for you know, real time. And that makes us think. What if we just handled our late data later? We don't really need it for those real-time applications if it's already late. So what we did was we went back to our original drawing board of our you know, beautiful simplified diagram. And we said, what if we just add another octopus arm and that acquisition job took all the data that was older than a certain threshold and just shoved it into this other pub sub topic. And that pub sub topic was continuously writing the data into GCS. That way, when you do have one of these, you know, one bad apple, one of these factories has a backup event, there's a, you know, a storm that blows, a natural disaster that causes a satellite dish to get blown over, that data is fine because when the factory comes back online, all the data comes in and, you know, our acquisition job just shuffles it off into a special late data topic. And the rest of our jobs are fine because they're now just dealing with recent data. They don't really care. Like they can still do their clever windowing and they can still manage their watermarks, but the scope of their problem has been reduced significantly. We can now play with what that means. So what do you do with all that late data? Um, so this is not a single file, or this is not three different files. This is a single file. I would frame it and hang it on my wall, but I live in New York City and my apartment ceilings are not that tall. Uh, and so what this does is it creates a bunch of temporary topics and subscriptions. It deploys a bunch of special streaming recovery jobs of all of our streaming jobs that are listening to these topics. And then it deploys one of these like Google provided data flow templates, which reads the data out of GCS and shoves it into a pub sub topic or the temporary ones. And, you know, we do the recovery that way. And it's really well orchestrated, but it's a very manual process. It requires an engineer to understand what's going on. They have to sit there and kind of babysit the whole thing. It's usually, you know, 
half a day to a day of engineering time just to do this properly. And we started to ask ourselves, well, this is a really big improvement, but how can we do better? Batch mode, as we've come to conclude, is better. So let's talk about what I really mean by that. So let's talk about batch versus streaming in Apache Beam. So Apache Beam does this really cool thing where it you know, treats all data as this unified idea of a P collection. And a P collection is either bounded or unbounded. It's a very like closure-like concept. If you guys have written closure, um, I always would love to write a, beam, write a Beam job in closure, but it it treats these two things as the same type effectively. And then the mode you're running in, it doesn't really, it's just, it, it can do the same thing in these two different ways. Uh, generally, a streaming job is going to talk to a real-time queue like PubSub, and PubSub is going to treat the data that comes out of that queue as this unbounded P collection. And then like a batch job will talk to like a file or a database and will treat the result of that file or the result of that query as a bounded P collection. Um, in a streaming job, we're generally processing data piece by piece, as opposed to in batch mode, you know, these different stages will run until they're done. And then also with like streaming jobs, you kind of just have this wasted overhead. This is just kind of true for most streaming, um, especially at our scale, like until you get really, really, really big, um, there's there's some sort of trade-off where, you know, this a certain amount of overhead has to be provided because you have to assume there's a certain amount of fluctuation as opposed to batch mode, which tends to be a lot cheaper because, you know, you just do as much as you can until you're done. And on top of that, Dataflow actually offers, um, you know, just the vCPUs are cheaper to use when you're doing batch mode. Um, talking about the sources and sinks, this is kind of what defines a streaming versus a batch job. So a streaming job is going to use something like PubSub IO or Kafka IO, and a batch job is going to use something like JBTC IO, which lets you do some sort of database query, a BigQuery IO, which lets you query BigQuery, text IO, Avro IO, file IO, these guys that will like read from files, um, and also generate sequence I'm going to throw in here. So generate sequence is this nice thing that just creates a finite P collection. Uh, and it's also worth noting that, you know, in the streaming side, there's actually a streaming version of text IO and Avro IO and file IO. Um, those guys are, we don't actually use those streaming variants, um, but we do use the streaming variant of generate sequence, which will just create a sequence, but it'll create an unbounded sequence that just keeps going forever. And then you can create a timer of how frequently new elements get added. Uh, to kind of break down how that looks for our use case. So streaming jobs for us tend to read and write from PubSub topics, while our batch versions would read and write to GCS. So GCS for us is Google Cloud Storage. It's if you're used to Amazon, it's the same thing as S3. Um, it's a distributed file or object store. And we just store our files in there. Uh, we personally use NDJSON, um, so new line delimited JSON, but this could be Avro, it could be, you know, protobufs, it could be all sorts of different things. It's just what we ended up using and it seems fine and someday we'll probably make it better. Um, practically, uh, this is what our streaming job looks like. So you've got some sort of core transformation you're trying to accomplish, uh, usually modeled as some sort of P transform from like string to string. And then you've got a PubSub IO read and write on either side of that P transform. And then if we were to translate that into a you know, batch job, we would use something like text.io. And text.io just replace that P transform where, or the P begin transform where you have uh, PubSub.io and you'd replace the end one, the P done transform where you have, you know, PubSub.io with text.io. And the transform in the middle stays the same, which is what I think is the best thing about being here. Um, and practically this is how it looks for us with our GCS paths. So we can use wildcards for the source and then we'll use prefixes for the sinks and this is kind of just specifying what files you're reading from and then where do you want to write them out to. Um, and something that's really useful here is we can actually partition our data in GCS by date. So this is what we're doing now. And just to give you a little bit of a preview is that as we're consuming our late data, if we consume that data on 2021 07 to 15, we're going to write that into a prefix with that date. And then if we want to process all the late data for that day, it's just one prefixed area. And then the output can go to another area of that same prefix. And we have a nice understanding of the stages that we, of transformations that we would be applying in batch mode um, in GCS with this date, representing this late data. Uh, let's talk about a slightly more complex job. So this is a really common pattern for us. You have some sort of transform, you're reading from PubSub, writing to PubSub, and the transform needs to get some sort of configuration information. So in this case, we have like a generate sequence, which I was mentioning before which is going to be generating you know, arbitrary numbers from one to infinity with some sort of delay between them being created. And then we map that P collection into requests to some sort of internal API, which gives us some configuration. And then we have a P collection of configuration, which update, which gets a new element every five minutes. And we collapse that into a P collection view and load that in as a side input into the transform. 
Um, and if we only swap the PubSub IO transforms in this, this would actually still be a streaming job because the generate sequence is still an unbounded peak collection. However, if we swap the transform for a finite generate sequence of just one element, then suddenly this is a batch job. So this is the other kind of modification you'd have to make to make one of these jobs into a batch job. Um, in code, it looks something like this. So we've got our core transform, which in this case is our rollup metrics transform. Uh, it might consume strings and output strings. And you know, it's passed a bunch of options. And then, you know, based on the options that we're passing in, we're gonna set some sort of mode. We're gonna say we're in pub sub mode. And when we're in pub sub mode, we're going to be passing in, you know, a pub sub IO. We're gonna be using pub sub IO as the first stage of our pipeline and pub sub IO for the last stage of our, pub, our uh, pipeline. In this case, we're using pub sub IOs with timestamp attributes because we're setting the timestamp attribute to a um, pub sub event attribute. And this is kind of how we're letting it manage the watermark. If we were then going to use this in file mode where we were not setting it to, you know, consumer mode equals pub sub, we're then going to be reading from files. Um, and the one difference here is we're going to have to manually assign the timestamp as we're reading from the files. Uh, we have to use with allowed timestamps queue, which is supposedly deprecated, but I haven't found an alternative. And we're going to, and what's actually really cool about this is we can even mix and match these options. So for example, you could write, uh, you could deploy a job that's, you know, consumer mode for pub sub and, uh, you know, producer mode for, uh, to files, and that's actually really good for debugging. You can create a dummy subscription to a pub sub topic and then write to your local files. Or you could write one that's reading from files and writing back to pub sub if you want to do a targeted recovery for just a single job. Uh, and after we did this a few times, we decided to standardize this. We created this kind of unified library called Event.io. And Event.io has, you know, manages this, you know, source and sync behavior. So it, uh, it does all the conditional switching. It does the JSON serializing and deserializing. It does the event timestamp managing. It does the source and sync options. Uh, and we manage these modes of like reading and writing from pub sub, files, uh, BigQuery, or even like a logging mode if you just want to, you know, instead of writing out to a file, write out to standard out. We find that really nice. And it makes developing locally a lot easier because now I'm writing this job that's supposed to work in pub sub, but I can just work with local files uh, because I feel really confident that event.io is doing what it's supposed to. And uh, it does get complicated for source and sync, multi-source and sync jobs, but that's a following of us. And it kind of ends up in this situation where we kind of have this like one ring to rule them all vibe, where, you know, when you go in to write a new job, you just know I'm going to use event.io for consuming and writing. And the in-between is the only thing I really have to worry about, which feels good. So let's talk a little bit about how we automate this now, because now we've kind of standardized everything to being able to run both batch and streaming. So we're going to talk a little about Airflow. So Apache Airflow is kind of like, you know, a cron manager, if you want to think of it that way. I don't know a good way to really describe it. People are probably offended by that statement. Um, but it's a scheduler, it's an orchestrator, and it monitors these like DAGs of tasks. So you basically define the thing you want to do as this task, and then you connect them in this DAG shape, and they can run them all at once on some sort of schedule. Um, the DAGs and the dependency behavior, behavior between the tasks are all defined in Python. Uh, you have these like built-in operators, which lets you easily build tasks that, you know, plug into well-known popular services. Basically the entire uh, GCP API is expressed in operators, which is really nice. And you've got this really expressive API for these common patterns in ETL, like backfilling and short circuiting and time zone management, which we are bad at. Um, and this is a classic example of like something we'd want to be accomplishing with it. So we have a bunch of, this is like our compute and mail reports. So we have a bunch of tasks where we're waiting for things to have finished somewhere in our system. Uh, we do some sort of computation into a temporary table. We then, you know, upsert that temporary table into somewhere else. Um, and then we email these reports while deleting the temporary table simultaneously. At the very end, we have this simple task that just sends a ping somewhere to say that everything's okay. Um, Practically, when you're writing the code, it looks something like this. So this is a really simple Airflow DAG. Uh, you kind of just define this DAG object, and then you define these um, you know, tasks, and you link them together. Uh, in this case, it's trivial. You're just saying, hello world, with a Python operator and a bash operator. Uh, so these aren't ones that we personally use that much, but it's really simple. And you can imagine, in this case, the operator is implemented as a class. And you know, each task is just an instance of that class. So you can imagine how there are operators out there for doing certain database queries or, for example, deploying a data flow job. And then this is what it looks like for us to do that with our data flow jobs. 
So this is our calculated metrics jobs followed by a rollups job. And what we do is we define our GCS paths as strings and we pass them into these jobs. And then we make the jobs downstream of each other. Uh, so we're using GCS for reading and writing and all of our topics are mapped roughly to these GCS paths. Uh, and they are now our intermediaries. So the DAG structure now roughly mirrors the structure of our you know, DAG of data flow streaming jobs that are running. We're constro controlling the order in which these batch jobs are run. And to get a little bit more into those GCS paths, so that like curly bracket DS, that's actually a macro that templates in the date that this job is running for. It's actually the execution date. It's the day that it was running minus one. It's a little weird, but it works really well in this use case. So for example, if this job is running at midnight, it's going to run for midnight over the past day of data uh, that we had properly put into GCS with our you know, late data pipeline where it was all prefixed nicely. And if you note how these all have really undescriptive names, it's like metrics A, metrics B, metrics C, uh, that's on purpose. And it's because GCS has this ability to do wildcarding, but the, where you can actually kind of say, you know, this and this, but you have to, the wildcarding is only supporting one character at a time. So it's a weird pattern to enforce, but it does work really well for us if we have a job that we want to be able to read from multiple outputs. So for example, if we have something that ultimately writes the time series database and we want to be able to read the late metrics, the calc metrics and the rollup metrics all at the same time, we can use this all metrics pattern at the bottom. So just to give you a reminder of what our streaming pipeline looks like. Um, so we were consuming data as raw events into this acquisition topic. And then we have all these like transformations we're doing, reading and writing to a bunch of different pub sub topics. And ultimately we're doing these item potent writes into our time series database and Postgres. And then this is what it looks like for our, you know, batch jobs that are scheduled by Airflow. So the late events all exist in GCS. They were written there by this forking from, you know, our streaming pipeline. And these jobs, you know, run one after another in order. Uh, and there's slightly more complicated reads here. Uh, we probably get them more in sync with each other, but it's something we're still figuring out. And we can just schedule these with Airflow to run in a specific order that makes sense for these transformations. Uh, one last thing we want to that's worth talking about is that you don't always want to run these jobs every night. Sometimes there's no late data. So what we do is we can actually detect if there's late data in GCS for the prefix we want to run over. So this is one of the really nice features of Airflow. It has this concept of short circuiting. So we have this, uh, this Google Cloud Storage prefix sensor, which basically checks, is there any data matching this prefix or any files that match this, objects that match this prefix? And if there's not, it does this soft fail which causes all the downstream pet tasks to just be skipped. So it's not actually a real failure. It just causes the DAG not to run, which is really nice. Um, and then the ultimate effect of this looks something like this. So we schedule it for 30 minutes after midnight and we have this first stage where we're checking for late data and then we run batch versions of each one of our transformations all the way through and these batch jobs are deployed into Dataflow and run through and you know do the computation reading and writing to GCS and ultimately write into our time series database and into Postgres in our those item potent rights where we can, you know, if there's some overlap, it's fine. If we, you know, if they show up late, that's fine too. So to kind of do a recap on what the problem we had here. So Odin uses Beam to process metrics in real time for both real time and historical use cases. Uh, the real time problem was, or processing was kind of broken by these factory specific network partitions that were happening. And uh, this was partly solved with some complex windowing, but it wasn't great. And then ultimately we decided to cap the amount of lateness we would handle within you know, real time and push that to a separate topic to keep our real time applications you know, pristine. Um, so the solution that we came up with here is that all of our jobs run in a batch or streaming mode. They can be deployed either way. We compile two different templates for it, but it still effectively works. Um, we only use our streaming mode for the recent data, um, which is really nice. So it's the data that customers need ASAP and not late stuff that's showing up. And then late data is handled totally separately with these batch jobs nightly. So every night we just kick off and anything that showed up late that day gets processed. If there's nothing, nothing happens. And then streaming jobs now run at smaller deployments and auto scaling happens less frequently and everyone is happier. And the watermark stuff still works, but it's the problem space has been scoped down significantly. Uh, to talk a little bit about what's next for this. So this has been like a big labor to get us there. Um, but I think we have a lot of ideas of where we want to go. So um, one, I think we could use the late data airflow DAG that we have now for backfilling old customer data. So that means that, you know, 
I mean, it's hard for some engineers to accept this, but our customers existed or existed and had data from before they were customers of ours. So when they first come on board, they have all this data, usually in some sort of air-gapped machine because manufacturing IT is rightfully paranoid and they want to get it into our system. And ideally, we wouldn't have to do all these transformations separately. It would just be part of our natural pipeline. So what we can do is we can just write code that just dumps it into our system in the format that it would normally be being pushed in real time. And then the late data pipeline would just magically pick it up and push it into our system within 24 hours. And the goal of that is to try, try and just reduce that time to value that we're seeing for our customers during onboarding. Um, we can also use the late data pipeline for you know low, pri low priority metrics. So something that I realized recently in building this is that uh, this is significantly cheaper than it is the two, like these batch jobs are cost per metric, which is kind of our, you know, negotiation with our business of, you know, how much money we should be spending is significantly lower for us to run these jobs in batch mode versus stream mode. I actually don't want to say how much cheaper because I think it's fiscally irresponsible to say that until I have done some more testing, but it is very surprising from early tests how much cheaper it is. And so uh, I think that there's a use case here where some metrics, some customers don't need certain metrics in real time. Some metrics are just needed, you know, for just historical analysis. And those metrics, there's no reason for us to be paying a premium to process them. It's possible these like second tier metrics could be processed exclusively by the late data pipeline. And we would just identify that at the very top of the pipeline when they're coming in in that acquisition job. Uh, I also want to try and replace this late data fork. I don't think it's really natural and it currently only works for the use case of late data. Ideally, what we're doing now is we're writing all of our early data also to Avro files in GCS as a you know area of being able to do full recoveries if we need to. And what I would like to do when we're writing that, we're writing it out in both the process time and then also the event time windows. And what I would like to do is be able to write, have this job go and just read all the files from there where the difference between the event time and the process time is greater than the amount of lag we would have accepted. And the nice thing about doing it that way is then we can tune what that threshold is or what we're filtering on and do targeted recoveries if we ever have like a real time processing issue. Uh, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about was that we have two really great features of our uh, QA environment. The first is that you know we push all of our production data into QA. Uh, and then the second thing that we, while anonymizing it, while it's going into QA, which is pretty cool, and then the second thing we have is this thing called party cannon, which just spews out trash data all day to try and break the environment. And so I have this dream of building this thing called, or this thing that you know makes the late, the production data coming in uh, extra late to continuously test the late data pipeline. And uh, I I think it'd be really cool to call it the after party cannon. I think it'd be a really fun name. Um, so thank you for joining my talk. Uh, if you have any thoughts please email me. Uh, I would love nothing more for someone to email me and say, Devin, you've wasted all of your time. You should have just been enabling the make watermarks better flag. And that'd be, that'd make my day.